Okay, here we go. Test, 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 test. Roll music? Let's roll it. Welcome to the Unknown Morning Show. It's the show where we explore radio, podcasting, TV, gear, gearheads, and making money with a hot mic and other stuff too. This is the Unknown Morning Show. I'm Mandy Montana. And I'm Chuck McKinley. We wanted to talk to some of our good friends in the broadcast business and, and, we have one of our good friends here, Rod Wayne. Hi, Rod. Well, good morning. How are you? Or good just, evening, good afternoon, wherever you may be. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> That's right, because, you know, it, 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 in the digital world, it can be anything, anywhere. Anytime. But thanks so much for joining uh, Mandy and myself on the Unknown Morning Show. We appreciate you coming on in today for the free Great coffee. being here with you guys. We feel that origin stories are very, very important, and as a broadcaster, and I still think of you, even though you're not actively on the air, I still think of you as a broadcaster. Oh, absolutely. And I, I, we will talk later about what I do now for a living, and it's still basically broadcasting. Let me ask you something. And when you, What was your earliest memory? Were you looking at a radio and you thought, you know, looking at the radio grill and saying, I want to do that. What was your earliest memory? Yeah, I think it just kind of slowly happened. Uh, I always, I loved music and I always wanted my own radio. I remember going to a garage sale that my Aunt Melba put on in Dallas and uh, she had this old black Motorola. You know, it was mono and uh, it had this silver, what do you call the front part of it where the speaker is? The grill. Yeah, the grill thing. So that was cool. So I got that, listened to the radio all the time. And, um, at a very young age, uh, we went to Radio Shack. Y- y'all remember those? Mm-hmm. Uh-huh. And so I, I got the, the the realistic, you know, PA sound system with a microphone and speakers and all that, much to my grandparents' dismay, who was who I lived with at the time, because my, my bedroom backed up to my grandfather's. Uh-oh. And if I'm back there with that microphone on, and then my parents discovered headphones and life was good again. So I, I think thus began my hearing issues. Uh, but I would just sit there and practice in my first... Uh, um, I guess uh, stereo was had a turntable. It had an eight track, and it had dual cassette, ca- dual cassettes. So I would sit there and record music and stuff uh-huh. from records, little forty fives and things, or from the radio. And then I'd come in and do my own DJ stuff. So I started off at a very young age doing my own, you know, radio station, and it was KROD, obviously. And of course, there really is a KROD in in El Paso, but they never did send me that bumper sticker. Are they still active? <laughs> Well, they were uh, several years ago. I'm sure they are. They're, they're an AM station, and they're owned by Town Square. Oh. Yeah. Can we say them on the air? Can we why say not? I mean, why not? We all worked for them. <laughs> yes. Yes. So, yes. yeah. Oh, but, they're an ESP, ESPN. That's it. Sports, yeah. yeah. So, I uh, started doing that, but, you know, my uh, my father said to me when I was young, and it's funny, and I took his advice, one of the few things I actually did listen to him on, he said, son, you better find jobs where they pay you to talk or you're going to be in trouble. <laughs> and that's what I've done my whole life. Every job I've ever had has been basically, you know, based around talking mm-hmm. because at a young age, I was an entertainer. Yeah, I was never afraid of a microphone. Uh, my parents would tell stories about, we'd go to a place called Shotgun Sam's in Dallas, right by White Rock Lake. And it was a pizza place and uh-huh. you'd go and they'd have entertainment up there and it was fun for kids. But I would hop up on the stage with the musicians and want the microphone and get up there with them. So obviously in a past life, if you believe in that, I must have been an entertainer because <laughs> I was never afraid of audiences. I'd get up. I'd wanted to be on stage. You know, I started taking acting classes when I was in elementary in Dallas uh, with J.B. Corn, who was kind of a big name back then. And a uh, matter of fact, uh, the school that I went to for acting is where they cast the Bad News Bears out of in the Dallas area. Really? A lot of wow. So I got there about a year too late. So that was kind of neat. And so I was always a bit of an entertainer and a talker and a chatter. And I loved recording and being on a microphone. I thought that was cool. And then started getting into the radio thing and had fun with it. And then uh, I was in high school and we were doing Grease, the musical. Okay. And so I was cast as Vince Fontaine, who was the DJ, as Mm -hmm. you'll remember. Mm -hmm. And it was my teacher said, nope, you can go out for Danny. But there was no way I was playing Danny. I was not the type. She said, I've got the perfect role for you. So, you know, the main brain, Vince Fontaine from the House of Wax, you know, stacks and stacks of wax, great fun role. Well, in, in Greece, there is a scene in the musical anyway where they go to the drive through And so in the drive through they are watching this like horror musical of, of or this horror movie of like a, a mad scientist and everything. So she invited me along with another uh, uh, actor or two in the show to go to a recording studio in Mesquite. He's going to put together the sound effects of, of the, the, the movie that okay. they're watching the drive through So I got to be the mad scientist, you know. And all I can remember, I think the line was something like, look, it's a van wolf or something like that. Some <laughs> bad voice I did, you know, based on whatever, you know, it's oh. alive. 
And so we had so much fun doing that. And the guy that was doing the recording in the little studio, he said, you know, you're really kind of a natural at doing this stuff. You should consider, you know, doing radio or going on the air. Uh, I was uh, just about to get my first car. I think I was about 16 at the time. He said, you know, we have a radio station in Mesquite and it's K-E-O-M. Yeah. How lucky was I that my school district, they had a radio station program, but the radio station program was at West Mesquite. I went to North Mesquite, Uh, but I went over there and auditioned. And so Saturdays I would drive over there and do a radio show. So that's kind of where I got in high started school. in high school. Yeah. I love you know? KEOM. Oh yeah, you know what? And they're still good. In yes, fact, they're better than ever. They're they're seventies. They're they're still seventies. Seventies, eighties, some nineties. Yeah, and they give local information and good with. And I'll tell you what, the kids do a great job. In fact, they're far better than I was back in my day. Well, you know the 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 alpha medias, the large radio conglomerates have been mm-hmm. trying to get them for decades now because they're sixty thousand watts. Mm-hmm. And yeah, they're not giving it up. And I think it's good, fa- I should. think it's fabulous that they give. The kids, that early experience, that early touch into broadcasting, mm-hmm. so they go, yeah, I want to do it, or I don't want to do it. Well, there's so few entry-level positions available in the industry now. Right. Oh, boy. Well, that's You're right. right. It's not like it used to be. In mm-hmm. fact, later on, when we talk about what I'm doing for a living now, we're going to tie back in how I go right back to KEOM. Uh-huh. It's kind of a cool connection story where you, you come full circle. <laughs> cool. But it's neat. But yeah, so that's how I got my start doing that. And then at 18 years old, I was working... I guess it was my senior year in high school. I was working at a place called Children's Palace, which was okay. a big toy store. Back in the days of Cabbage Patch Kids, and that was a nightmare. <laughs> I don't ever want to revisit <laughs> stocking all those toys at Christmas time. But a lady came in, and uh, we were talking, and I was going above and beyond to help her out. And uh, she said, yeah, are you going to school? I said, yeah, I'm in high school. You're getting ready for college. I want to go into broadcasting and all this and do radio. And she said, you know, my brother, Robert Jones, runs like a radio thing. Okay. And uh, so it was ABC SMN back in the day. So I called him up. He said, come on up. So I came up, interviewed. And basically, I started off just like, you know, making the coffee, taking phone calls, requests. You mean ABC, ABC Network? ABC Network, yeah. So over at Fair Park? Was that where they uh, No, this is actually was in the Banner Building off of Coit Road in Dallas, That's Texas. right. No, no, yeah, no. I remember touring that one time. It was like... Probably in '95 or something, yeah. and it was just you know massive rolls of stu- ro- uh, ro- uh, studios, uh, rows of studios, oh, yeah. and everything. Oh, they yeah. had the Impressive. Motown. They had the Motown Gold format, which is where I was working, and they had like a Golden Oldies where I got to meet Jerry Thomas. Which was because he's an old radio legend. Got to work with John Rohde. Uh, ah, cool. Got to work on the. They also had a uh, a hard rock format, and I'm trying to remember the f- name of the format. It'll come to me in a minute. But they had the DJ's names were like Mad Max Hammer, Booby Bondage. <laughs> I mean, and some other stuff. But I got to meet some pros that at the time in in my youth I didn't realize who these legends were that I was. Redbeard? Did you mean it was Redbeard? Never there? met Redbeard, but listened to Redbeard. Yeah. Now I, I did get to work with a lot of the KZEW and Q102 people later on in life, and that's that's coming up down talking about my radio career. But it was neat, and uh, so and then they realized I, I was good at doing voices because that's one of the things that kind of got me into acting and voiceover stuff was I would do impressions. Uh-huh. So when I was young, you know, I was doing my my you know Wolfman Jack. Ooh, the Wolfman Jack, baby. <laughs> Yeah, it's good. <laughs> and then I do, you know, you know, Elvis, you know, thank you, thank you very much. You know, you're a kid. And then I started getting into just it, doing impressions of whomever. You know, you do John Wayne, you know. Well, that'll be the day. Oh, and uh, Ronald Reagan, you know. Well, there you go again. I do like a good jelly bean. I have a request. Give us yeah. your most, <laughs> what is your, what would be the most obscure celebrity? The most obscure celebrity. Impression that I do? Yes. Oh, and you know, and I don't even do impressions like I used to. Um, no, I think they're passable, more than passable. Well, That's mm-hmm. just my humble I'll opinion. Tell you, Rod. I'll tell you one of the fun ones uh, that I had to stop doing. Um, a friend of mine who's actually found out we're related. We're like second or third cousins. We have the same great great grandfather. She uh, was writing some plays, and she did one that was kind of a musical called Baloney on Red, White, and Blue. And it was Manette Satter, White, Trent. Uh-huh. And so she was writing this character named Senator Montrose around me, my impressions, because she knew what I could do. And she said, give me a list of all the presents that you do. So, you know, I said, well, you know, Carter, you know, my fellow Americans, I like peanuts. Uh, you know, Richard Nixon, uh, you know, we had Ronald Reagan and uh, and whoever else it was. I think it was George Bush, senior, uh-huh. you know. Yeah, not like broccoli, not going to do it, which is really nothing more than Dana Carvey's. Yeah. Uh, let's be honest. <laughs> that's, that's where I learned to do it because Dana did it so well. Thousand points of light. And she said, can you do Bill Clinton? I said, not really. She said, can you learn it? I said, sure. So I watched tons and tons of videos and, and recordings. So I got Bill Clinton down. 
for the show, and it was fun, and Bill Clinton stole the show, because every time I did Bill, Bill Clinton, I got a little bit looser with the acting and personality, and, and you couldn't improvise, because the entire play, at least my lines, were actual quotes from the president. So I had to memorize them, which was hard for me. So I couldn't mess up and I couldn't improvise. But the one time I did is I kind of gave a thumbs up as Bill Clinton. They liked it. But I started learning how to do Bill Clinton. But I had to stop because for some reason it became addictive. And I could not stop doing Bill Clinton's voice because it was too much fun. But it was so hard on my throat. Oh, I had to say I can't do it anymore. But we'd go to restaurants, you know, and they'd go, what would you like, you know? And I'd go, hey, you sure are pretty. Now I've got a position as an intern in the White House. If you, you'd like to come out and talk to me, wear that blue dress. Yeah. So, <laughs> and they're like, stop. <laughs> Can't take you out anywhere. Oh, my I goodness. Just, That's I'd, good. call, I'd call people up and do Bill Clinton. Hey, this is, this is Bill. I need a special table tonight for me and Hillary. Yeah. Need a high chair for Chelsea. Another table for my girlfriend. There you go. <laughs> Yeah, but the fun stuff. So in that oh, doing good. all that is what got me into it. But yeah, Bill Clinton was one that I had to learn to do by request, and that was fun. We just sit there and keep us entertained another couple hours. Oh, sure. We can Please. do that. You keep the coffee rolling. We're okay. Good. But so doing impressions and acting, and of course, I, I did theater in high school and in college and locally in Tyler with the... Uh, 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 Tyler. Tyler Civic Tyler? Tyler. 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 Theater Center. <laughs> Said it so many times, I couldn't think of it. So lots of great production there. So I enjoy stage acting. It's fun, but, you know, which is kind of what got me into the voice acting, to go back to that uh, thing in high school, doing the uh, the movie sound effects, you know, for the drive-in. I said, this is fun. So doing radio was great. And so I started taking voiceover classes in Dallas. Uh, I think first ones I took were at KD Studio. Okay. And then later on, uh, I got to work with great professionals like Bob Magruder, Jerry Houston, Betty Zoller. These are big names in the Southwest that kind of really were big in the day and then started teaching it when they, they, you know, got down the road. So you learn how to do narration. You learn how to do commercials. But I found more fun in like doing voice acting because when I was young, my dream was to be like the next Mel Blanc or you do mm. voices ah. for Disney or Warner Brothers. The Man of a Thousand Voices. It's fun. Yeah. I mean, it is, you know, it doesn't matter what you look like. You can be anyone. Mm -hmm. And you get behind a microphone and you can tell people you're six foot tall and good looking and they'll believe you because they can't see you. Have you ever approached a studio for work? Or maybe video games, perhaps. You know, I, I, I've taken classes on those things, you know, but I've just never pursued it. It's, uh, I don't know why. I, either I was so busy working or I was afraid they would say you're not good enough, which is always a self-esteem issue, I think, with a lot of performers. Yeah, oh, but do you yeah. feel, I, I had read somewhere about, you know, folks that are professional voiceover mm -hmm. artists that do it full time. Mm -hmm. And they say that you have to almost devote 40 hours a week plus your full-time job to ease into it. Do you think that's it too? I, I would agree. You know, for years doing radio, I also did voiceovers on the side. And when it began to pick up for me, um, I had to kind of stop because my work got to be so much. I did not want to spend four more hours a day doing the same thing of sure. recording scripts and editing them. I'm like, it just, I lost interest. You know, what used to be fun, and my dad used to always say, you know, find a job that you love doing and you'll never work a day in your life. So I've always picked jobs that may not have paid a lot of money, but I enjoyed doing them, so it made up for it. But yeah, at the end of the day, I'm like, I just spent 10 plus hours, you know, vo doing voiceovers and editing. I, I don't want to do it anymore. That's kind of where I am now. But if I ever got into a situation and really decided, you know, I want to go try the, the voice acting thing, because, you know, it's called voice acting for a reason. You know, you can be, have a great voice and be a radio person, you know, or you can do, you know, be Gary Owens and have that, that big announcer voice. Yeah. You know? Tonight on Laugh-In. But it, can you act? And that's a big part of it because that's why it's called voice acting. So a lot of times you'll, you'll hear commercials and they're not trying to say, well, this week at Texas Capital Bank, we have a wonderful, sa blah, 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 great savings, blah, sure. blah, blah. But if you're a voice actor and you're acting, you know, I'm so fortunate that I bank with Texas Capital Bank because right now they've got great deals and it's helping me make a living or it's helping me save money. You're conversational. You're telling a story. You're talking to someone. And that's kind of the difference. Or, you know, you're doing a character. You know, and that's the acting part. You still have a bank commercial that still runs around here. You did it 10, 10 15 years ago? Close to 20, yeah. I remember, and Dave, our good friend Dave Moreland has oh, yeah. one. And I would tell Dave, I said, it's so comforting, Dave, that when the end of the world happens, will you tell me about it? <laughs> It'll make me feel so much better. Will you do that, please? Dave, make it for me, please. And Dave's commercial will still be running. That's right. Mm. Somewhere. It'll be like Fallout. You'll hear it in the background. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. Matter of fact, I think it was the, uh, the tag on Austin Bank. 
I did many years ago, and they will have other people voice it, but then my tag will still be there. Sure. Mm -hmm. Boy, and we don't do residuals in this area, which is terrible, because, you know, I could have bought a couple cups of coffee with that. Oh, yeah. I had a Texas Roadhouse commercial that ran for probably 15 years. crazy. Yeah, Yeah. that honestly was never paid for because it was part of the gig at the right, time yeah. where I was working that I recorded it. And so <laughs> years later, I'd long left the station and I would hear that Texas Roadhouse commercial and I'd be like, man. Well, isn't it's that good, strange when that happens? It is. It is. And and like you're saying, no residuals. There's there's yeah. nothing. It's, it's funny because people outside the industry have no idea that like you do something like that essentially for free. Hmm. And yet it persists but you know it's good conversations people say hey i heard your commercial great that's a neat thing because i did one years ago with jamie rhodes for currents and they ran that thing about 20 years okay and then i did one for bernard for bernard's mediterranean Mediterranean Mm. restaurant and it ran for about 20 years in fact i ran into him one day at brookshire's i'm like yeah that commercial is still running i said i'm glad that you like it you may want to consider a new one yeah yeah (laughs) so if it ain't broke i guess that's true if it's he's it still works it's okay we (laughs) will He's a good guy. So I've I've got a question. So you know, obviously, you know, you 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 you're in a point in your life where what do we? You're eighteen, nineteen, twenty. Um, when did you get your first experience um, out of ABC to a professional radio station, or did you or did you get, actually get work at the ABC network doing network radio? Yeah, I, well, I, I, luckily I got to go on in the air, which was kind of neat, and I wasn't just doing. I was doing a lot of production for them too. And because I did voices and and especially for the uh, Z uh, Rock, I think it was Z Rock. I okay, think that was, yeah. the, that was the station, Z Rock. And uh, so they they liked me doing voices for Mad Max Hammer and Booby oh. Bondage and these other characters. And I would walk into the gold station, which is like the old 50s doo wop and other stuff with Jerry T. Thomas, or was it just Jerry? I think it was Jerry Thomas and Lucretia, who was his sidekick. And they were the best. And one day I just walked in quietly because I knew how to go in the studio and I would just sit and listen and learn from the masters. And uh, earlier that day, I had told um, Jerry and Lucretia a joke. It was a a Ronald Reagan joke that you do in Ronald Reagan's voice. So I walked in quietly and I came in and sat down and I thought I was just going to sit here and watch them do their show for a minute. And then Jerry goes, well, we have a very special guest in the studio today. Believe it or not, he's in town and President Ronald Reagan is in the studio with us today. (laughs) Oh, my goodness. And I mean, my eyes got so big because here I am going live on big radio coast to coast. I know it's about to happen. And I just, the actor in me just kicked in. I just had to, you know, suck it up and perform. He's like, well, you know, well, what brings you to town, Mr. President? Well, you know, I'm I'm pushing the brand new IBM Ronald Reagan commemorative typewriter. <laughs> He's like, oh, well, tell us about it. Well, like me, it has no colon and no memory. Oh. Because <laughs> he had had colon cancer and had the surgery or whatever. But anyway, it was funny at the time. It's funny now. It's funny now. Yeah. <laughs> it's not too soon, is it? So so where did you go next? Uh, well, so did that for a while, and then I really got into college, and I really had to leave ABC SMN because college was taking my time. Mm-hmm. Back then, I, I thought I wanted to be a double major. Well, first of all, I was never even a good student. My mom's like, wow, you barely made it out of high school. You are an <laughs> overachiever. Good luck with that, honey. She does not have that accent, sorry. Uh, but so I was going to go, I wanted to go into psychology and then broadcasting, and I wanted to have a talk show. And I think this was even before Frazier ever even showed up on the scene, or maybe maybe he did. I don't, when did Frazier first premiere? What oh, that's year? a good question. Late 80s? Because yeah. Cheers was in the 80s, right? Yeah, and then yeah, that yeah. was the spinoff it, it, from it Cheers? Might have been, it might have been inspired by, by Frazier. Yeah. And uh, of course, and Kelsey Grammer's got the most wonderful voice, and he's a great actor. But I decided, no, psychology people are crazy. My apologies to all you psychology people, but you know I'm telling the truth. And uh, But it was just too much schooling. So I thought, you know, let me go ahead and just stick with the, the broadcasting. And I was doing theater, too, which which was great. So I was doing all that. And then somewhere into about two years, I was kind of spinning my wheels and I had some buddies that went in the military. So I decided to join the Air Force. And I said, well, I'll go in guaranteed for broadcasting so I can learn broadcasting and be in the Air Force and do that for a long time, travel and see the world. Well, they put me into a room in basic training. They go, well, the needs of the Air Force come first and you're not going into broadcasting, but you're going to be a cop, you know, security forces. And I thought, what was your reaction? Well, scared all the time, because every time you get pulled into a room, you think you've done something wrong. You're in trouble. I'm like, yeah. What? I'm like, okay. what did I do wrong now? I'm like, okay, because well, here's the deal. You can apply to cross-train in 36 months. Oh, okay, great. Apply being the key word. They still going to say no. So oh. I did. I went and became a cop, went through air-based ground defense, and did all the 
you know, uh, basics at the Lank- Lackland and M60 school, leadership school. It was fun. It was best thing I ever did. Really? I, yeah, because I finally learned that I could believe in myself and I could do anything I set my mind to do. Especially okay. if some big guy with bad breath is yelling at me. Yeah. Amazing. <laughs> what Motivating. I you know who I'm talking about, Master Sergeant, but I won't say your last name if you're listening. But uh, so that was the greatest thing. And then while I was in uh, the Air Force, my first assignment because was Desert Storm. So I, how, how lucky did I get? But I got stationed in Turkey, which was really a great experience. If you haven't been to Turkey, go. And uh, my commander found out that I had a broadcasting background. So we had uh, General Colin Powell. All these big wigs in the military were there for this big briefing. Because we were up for the best base in United States Air Forces in Europe. So we were up for it. And he wanted me to give the briefing. I'm thinking, I literally just put on my first stripe. I don't know anything about anything in the Air Force. He said, no, I'm going to give you the notes. And it'll show you where to integrate it with the slideshow. You just present it make us sound good. And I did. He's like, man, you made us sound so polished and good. So as a result, the next morning, I got to go to the breakfast, which I was the lowest ranking individual in there. Probably the lowest ranking might have been a senior master sergeant. Everybody else was colonel, you know, major, general. And I got to sit by General Colin Powell and me. Oh, wow. Wow. That was cool. We'll never That's forget special. that, man. Because I shook his hand. I just said, General, I said, just thank you for everything you do for the troops. He said, no, thank you, you know, because it's you that makes everything possible. Oh. Just, a very, just a neat guy. Neat yeah. Guy. But that was cool because I remember one guy said, you do realize you're the lowest ranking person here. I said, don't think I have not noticed that. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, for free food, I'll pretty much do anything. You know, and that helped me serve me well in my DJ career. You That's know, we'll right. Do for free oh, food. my goodness. Food but coupons. that was cool. Won't and and then my, my next assignment after that was uh, Griffiths Air Force Base, New York, which, hey, I closed that base. You sure did, Bill. And uh, so <laughs> mm. that's no longer in, even an operation, but my commander knew about my broadcasting background. And they had a thing that ran locally on the uh, radio stations there. They would record it there uh, on the base because they had their, um, it was, it was like AFARTS, which is like Armed Forces and Radio Television, uh, which I kept trying to get into, but I couldn't. They, I had to remain being a cop. But he wanted me to go audition because Master Sergeant Bill Duhame was retiring. It was called Griffiths Air Force was it Griffiths Air Force Base Weekly News or something? He'd talk about all the happenings of the base and the military, and they would Mm -hmm. take it and drop it off at a couple, three radio stations, and they would air it on Sundays for PSAs, you know, because you had to back then. And so one day I dropped it off at uh, one station, which was WKDY, which is a country station. And it was new country. I mean, back in the 90s when country was really good. Oh, yeah. And the guy said, uh, hey, is this you on the tape? I said, yes, it is. He said, do you want a job? I was like, Doing what? He goes, on the air. I'm like, well, I have a job. I'm a cop by day on in the Air Force Base. He said, well, talk to your commander because I'd love to have you in the evenings. So, uh, yeah, I went to my commander said, I got offered a job at the country station. He said, that would represent us really well because it was all about looking good. He goes, we'd be great in the community. We could talk. Yeah, yeah. He said, but if you're ever late for guard mount or there's ever a problem, you're out of there. So, you know, about a year or so, I was a cop by day and a DJ by night. Cool. Wow. And loved doing it. Of course, all my guys had to call and request songs and give me hard times, but that's nice. what they do. So that was fun. So, and when I got out of the Air Force, I guess it was about 94, I stayed in upstate New York for a while at WKDY. And it was, uh, yeah, and we just went about KDY. I think it was 102.4 KDY. It's been so long. So, and they actually wanted me to put on a twang. They said, now, you're from Texas. Now, that gives you credentials. That's your bona fide. <laughs> you, you talk about that. It goes, can you put on an accent? I'm like, do you know how long it took for me to get rid of it? No, I ain't putting that on for you. Yeah. So I didn't. You know, I wanted to sound, I wanted to sound big and polished like all these people I grew up listening to. So, uh, yeah, I did that for a while. And then uh, my grandmother had passed and uh, that was hard. And she had raised me most of my life. So as a result, uh, I was like, I just needed to go back home to Dallas and be around family and friends. So I left there, went back to Dallas and took a job working at Chili's waiting tables, you know, and being an in-house trainer and everything. And that was fun. And then uh, I took a voiceover class. And I was sitting there with a young lady. She said, you know what? Your voice is perfect for the radio station I work with. And she was doing part-time at that radio station, too. I said, which one? She said, the Oasis. I said, smooth jazz, 107.5, the Oasis. She smiled. She said, yes. I said, I have listened to that station since the day it came on the air, like in 1986 or 87. It was crickets chirping for 48 hours. (laughs) Coming soon, the Oasis. And it was smooth jazz. And I loved it. And I thought, are you kidding? I'm a huge fan. So she said, okay, here's the number. Uh, Call Mike. Mike, Mike, it was 
No, Mike Fisher was the PD. It's Brett Brett Michael, not not the musician. Yeah. Michael, but call him and and tell him you talk to me in a voiceover class. You're interested. You've got a radio background. So I did. And of course, you know, I put on my voice. I was like, hey, Brett, this is Rod Wayne calling about that position over there. At Smooth mm-hmm. Jazz. I, hopefully I wasn't that cheesy. I couldn't have been because I got the job. He called me back in 30 minutes. He said, oh, my gosh, is are you the one that just left that recording? I said, yeah, I goes, be in my office tomorrow. So I came in and said, he goes, man, you're perfect. When I told him I knew the history of the station, been listening forever, was a big fan. I'm your biggest fan. Uh, <laughs> he said, we'd like to try you on the weekend shift. And I mean, everybody listened and said, hire that guy. So that was great. You know, I got moved around. I got to do, um, you know, afternoons, got to do even evenings, kind of try different things. And I'll never forget, I was doing the afternoon filling in for Trevor Lay. And so I'm coming in after Tempe Lindsay. Ooh. Tempe Lindsay, yeah. Dallas Fort Worth Radio, huge celebrity voice, amazing lady. I mean, just great voice. You love her, but also huge heart and just neat people, just good people. Okay. And so she was, I think it was KZEW Q102. It's been so long. I, I didn't really listen to that music back then, but I know who they were. And then after that, I do my shift. And then coming after that is, um, oh, I, Randy. What is Randy's last name? I, he's going to kill me. I'm going brain dead now. Randy Davis. And so he walks in afterwards and he's got that big, deep smoker's voice. Cause every chance, every time a record was not playing, you know, he was out there smoking a cigarette and he said, man, you just need to take in where you are right now. You know, you're on this big stick and the Oasis, <laughs> we were, we were in the penthouse on, uh, I think it was Cherry Avenue or, or something like that in like the Highland Park kind of area. Wow. Yeah. It's a big penthouse, really nice. We're across the street from Kiss 106. Mm-hmm. Is it 106? Yeah. 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 I've been gone for so long. I mean, I left Dallas in 97. I've, I've forgotten all that stuff. But he you just need to realize, powerful station. You're doing the afternoon gig. This is huge. And I was a kid. I was 26, 25, something uh-huh. like that. But I knew how to sound bigger and older. And I was like, wow. And to have Randy Davis tell me that, that was kind of cool. So work with these great people. And, and like I said, in Trevor Lay, it was really cool. And uh, Dan Siebold was our production director. And he was just a really neat dude. He had an amazing voice, was incredible at production. And I had told him one time, I said, my idea would to be a DJ in a small town. And I guess Northern Exposure was out. I watched me a lot of TV. I got inspired. <laughs> <laughs> I tried to be Batman, but I just didn't have the money Bruce Wayne did. And uh, so um, he said, you know, I've got a friend of mine who's in town. His name is Cal Casey. He's also, he's a consultant, but also a headhunter. He is looking for a DJ in a small East Texas town. And this is because uh, the station was KWI, Sunny 106.5. Larry Bessler, their longtime afternoon guy, had passed away, and they were looking for a fill-in. And he said, look, you won't hurt any feelings. Just go go talk to him. Go check it out. So, okay. So I did. And... Uh, Took a day off and drove out, met Dudley Waller, saw the radio station, was so impressed that in East Texas, this station was as high tech as it was. Got to meet Dave Moreland, you know, and just loved those people. And I thought, I didn't, by the time I got home, I had an answer and I called Dave and said, yeah, I'll take the job. Mm. And so that was 1997, you know. Wow. And so I started doing the afternoon show on Sunny 106.5. Which was kind of cool. Awesome story. Oh, you get to which I feel like is how we met the three of us, right? Because you were doing afternoons at Sunny when later. Yeah. Well, so that was ninety seven. Yeah. And uh, in fact, I even left Sunny for a while. Decided to go back to the Dallas area because I was going to go back to college, go back to school because I dropped out to join the Air Force. Realized I was still not a good student. I really wanted to play more. (laughs) But I had taken a job at Champs Americana as their show host because they wanted my radio background. And uh, so that was taking up a lot of time. And I got to tell you, I was making more money doing that than anything else. And uh, 9-11 happened. Mm. And uh, I mean, I'll never forget. I had worked that evening and uh, I was crashed and I woke up and I had my phone on silent. And I, I saw that I missed several calls from the office, you know, from 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 champs. And I thought, well, that's weird. So I called Phaedra, who was working one of the office managers I said, Hey, you call him. Is everything OK? She said, are you not watching the news? Do you know what's going on? I said, no. She said, we're being bombed. I said, what? And so I turn on the TV and there it is. And I'm freaking out. I said, I, we can't figure out how to turn on all the TVs. I'm on my way. That was the quietest drive I've ever had in the DFW area. I mean, there were no planes and I was near DFW. I was living in Arlington at the time. Uh, there were no planes. There was hardly any traffic. It was the most surreal Weirdest thing ever. So I got there. We got all the TVs turned on, put on all the different news channels, and just sat there for hours just watching the news, just in disbelief. Hmm. 
you know. Talk about, you know, that that was crazy. Uh, and uh, it was a little while after that that uh, I got a call uh, from Sunny 106.5 from uh, Shelly Miller, a friend there, telling me about our good friend Patty Foster, you know, who was DJ locally. She'd been in a really bad car accident, and they didn't think she was going to make it. So I, I drove up, and uh, they just wasn't able to see her, unfortunately. And then Shelly said, oh, by the way, you know that uh, your old position is open again. I said, really? Because I was only gone about a year and a half. Not very long. And Jack Shell, whom I grew up listening to on KVIL in Dallas, which, by the way, Sonny, KWI, was very much modeled after KVIL. Polished. I mean, they ran a smooth ship. It was good. Dave and Dudley made that place yeah. big. And I was just honored to be a part of it. And I said, Jack Shell left. Wow. She said, would you be interested? And I said, yeah, tell Dave I'm coming back if he'll have me. And Dave called me back. He said, I'm looking at this post note on my desk. Is this true? You want to come back? I said, yeah. He said, let me go ask Dudley. So he goes and talks to Dudley. Five minutes later, Dudley said, get your butt back here, boys. <laughs> Load it up. You know, Dudley put me up in a oh, hotel cool. for a while until I could find a place to live. But yeah, I came on back. Let's go ahead and break and call it a segment with Rod Wayne. Look for part two, where you get your podcasts. This has been another episode of the Unknown Morning Show. I'm Mandy Montana. And I'm Chuck McKinley. This is our show to explore radio. Podcasting. Gear. And the gearheads that use the gear. And making money with a hot mic. And other stuff in between. We'd love for you to follow us on social media as well. Follow us on Facebook at The Unknown Morning Show. And Instagram at The Unknown Morning Show. See us on YouTube at The Unknown Morning Show. Thank you for listening to The Unknown Morning Show. I'm Mandy Montana. I'm Chuck McKinley. And remember, be kind and rewind.